Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday. I hope everyone is hanging in there in the passport and the immigration and the everything else rush, getting ready for the August recess. Um, I'm Ann Meeker. I'm deputy director for the Pop Box Foundation, uh, former caseworker, former casework manager, and I am delighted to welcome y'all back to another webinar in our casework navigator series uh, today on burnout and care. I know this is one of the topics that we get asked the most questions on, so I'm delighted uh, to see you all here and have this conversation today. Uh, and I won't spend too much time on an introduction so that we have as much time as possible for our speaker and for our discussion, um, because we know there's so much interest. And also, I will just start by saying this topic is really personal to me. Um, when I was a caseworker near Boston, someone sent me a link for the Schwartz Center on Compassionate Healthcare's annual conference for caregivers. And even though it wasn't directly casework related, I begged and begged my office to send me and they were kind enough to send me to the conference. Um, and I will say it was such a formative moment for me as a new caseworker um, to be around all these wonderful, brilliant, smart, insightful folks in the medical profession talking about things that I recognized from my casework, but in language that I hadn't heard to describe those experiences before talking about burnout and compassion fatigue and moral injury and resilience and how to think about resilience in care work, which is so connected to, to what we do as caseworkers. So that experience was so formative for me for how I approached my casework uh, and eventually managing a casework team. Uh, and also in thinking about this casework navigator series, thinking uh, from our, our position of privilege as an outside organization, what kinds of speakers, what kinds of expertise um, is important for us to be able to, to bring to caseworkers. So I owe the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare an enormous debt of gratitude, and I am so delighted to have uh, Dr. Julie Collier today with us from the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare. Uh, for a little bit of background, uh, Julie recently joined the Schwartz Center uh, as the Senior Director of Programs. She is a psychologist with extensive clinical experience working with children and families living with chronic and life-threatening illness. Uh, she spent 30 years at Stanford Medicine Children's Health, serving in a variety of clinical roles, and was co-chair of the Hospital Ethics Committee for 20 years. Uh, Julie went on to launch the Office of Professional Fulfillment and Resilience at Stanford Children's, which offers programs and resources to support the well-being of all team members. Uh, in addition to developing trauma-informed resources to mitigate clinician distress, she was instrumental in developing an organization-wide wellness survey and directed a support team to address threatening behavior directed towards staff. You'll all immediately see why I am so excited to have her here to talk about casework. Um, the, the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare has been a pioneer in studying compassion in healthcare. Um, Dr. Collier, you can give the Schwartz Center story uh, much better than I can, but to give a very, very brief introduction, the center was founded on the observation that the fundamental defining factor of healthcare is that human connection and that compassionate interaction. Uh, now, writ small, those compassionate interactions with everyone from your orderlies to your cafeteria workers, the front desk folks to your doctors, uh, nurses, executives, um, those individual moments have a huge impact on patients' experiences, but then writ large, they also impact the medical field's uh, ability, effectiveness, and resilience as a whole. Uh, and I don't think I need to make the case that the same is true in casework, that writ small, caseworkers do incredible work, uh, perform incredible services, often at great personal cost, and that writ large, uh, Congress's ability to do casework impacts its capacity to serve the American people. So today, Dr. Collier is going to share a bit from the Schwartz Center's work and research, and then in the discussion, I'm really looking forward to getting into uh, figuring out what caseworkers can adapt out there in the field. So Julie, thank you so much for being here. Uh, take it away. Thank you, and I really, really am um, so happy to be here with all of you, and um, I'm going to share my screen here um, and put this in presenter mode. Um, and in presenter mode, I can't really see the chat. So Anne, if anybody uh, puts um, anything in the chat, uh, feel free to interrupt me and, um, and uh, we can uh, stop for questions. Um, so uh, you know, when I was contemplating this, uh, the title slide, I thought, you know, the, the, the common core between what I understand about um, congressional casework and healthcare is that, that it's all human service work. Um, and so there are some commonalities um, in all of that work that I'm going to spend some time um, um, highlighting and, and giving some perspective on um, you know, the challenges that come with this work and the challenges with uh, sustaining our well-being and our compassion in this work. And then I will share a bit about 
uh, the short centers programs um, and our efforts to uh, try to help organizations cultivate cultures of, of compassion and healing for um, their workforce. There, okay, so um, Anne was um, gracious enough to provide me with a little bit of background on what all of you do. It's not something that I really knew much about before. Um, and, and really, there is a lot more in common um, than, than you may think. Uh, it seems to me that both, um, both areas of work really attract very mission-driven people, comes with long hours, demanding workloads. Um, you always have to be ready to mobilize for crises. There's a lot of exposure to traumatized individuals. Uh, I think the people who are drawn to uh, both healthcare and, and uh, the work that you do have a strong ability to compartmentalize emotions. And ideally, uh, we all need to be able to maintain compassion despite everything else on this list. And people who are drawn to any kind of human service work um, tend to be very connected to a set of values or beliefs, which really sets the stage for finding deep meaning and a sense of purpose in the work. And I always appreciated this quote, that there is no higher religion than human service. To work for the common good is the greatest creed. Now in healthcare, we talk about the double-edged sword of values and ideals. Um, and my guess is that you may see um, yourselves in a lot of this too. Um, so when you are very um, sort of value-centric, um, that you really are connected to um, a strong set of ideals, it has the potential um, to be a source of strength um, and it can really help you persevere through periods of adversity and, and deprivation. But these ideals um, can also really create challenges for us. They can become obstacles um, to seeking help. And in some ways, they're both our greatest um, asset and our most significant Achilles heel. Uh, um, so they're both a strength and a vulnerability. And when you, um, and when you ask purpose-driven, high-achieving individuals who are selfless, committed, and stoic how they are doing, after they've experienced something really challenging, often you will hear, I'm fine. But I'm fine is often just code for really something else, frustrated, irritable, numb, exhausted, a whole host of other feelings that um, we either feel like we don't have time to address or just aren't quite sure that it's um, uh, helpful to address it. Um, so we're going to unpack that a little bit. Now, healthcare is finally coming around to this idea that we have to acknowledge that we are not bulletproof um, and that the work we do um, absolutely leaves a mark. And um, this is a, a favorite quote from um, Rachel Naomi Remen, the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as being able to walk through water and not get wet. So what she's really tapping into is um, that the impact, uh, that there's tremendous impact that comes with exposure to trauma and traumatized individuals. And it's referred to sometimes as the cost of caring. And it's what makes, makes human service work uh, very different from most other professions. You may have heard the terms vicarious trauma or secondary traumatic stress. Um, those terms refer to uh, this idea that there can be emotional residue that comes with exposure to traumatic stories um, or witnessing fear and pain that others have experienced. I've never actually really liked those terms because I've always felt that the words vicarious and secondary are somewhat diminishing of what we actually experience in these situations. So I actually prefer this idea of, of small T and big T trauma. Um, so small T trauma is any event that exceeds our capacity to cope or leads to a change in occupational functioning. So small, uh, small T traumas are, are smaller than the, the kind of classic big T events that we think of, war, major injury, that sort of thing. But there tend to be many more of them and there can be a cumulative impact which really leaves its mark over time. 
And human service work of any sort carries um, this inherent risk of exposure to uh, traumatic events um, and, ex and the exposure to pain and suffering of others. When our resilience reservoir is, is depleted, if we are exhausted or depleted, the next small T event that we experience will have um, a much greater impact. Um, and if you think about the, the, the past three years with the pandemic and everything else that has happened, we've had an awful lot of small T traumas um, with some really significant big T events as well. So this is what happens to our nervous system in the aftermath of trauma, um, including repeated small T trauma. Uh, we have a, a window of tolerance that is uh, this optimal zone of arousal where you're able to function and deal with day-to-day -day stress most effectively. But trauma and extreme stress, uh, stress can bump you out of this zone of optimal functioning and you can become um, emotionally dysregulated uh, and end up in either a state of hyperarousal or hypoarousal. And living outside of our window of tolerance for extended periods of time then contributes to uh, burnout, which I'm going to talk a little bit about. And this idea of compassion fatigue, which, um, uh, spoiler alert, I'm going I'm to say right now that compassion fatigue is actually not an accurate, correct term. It's really something else that's going on, but we're, we're going to get to that. So first, um, a little bit about burnout. Um, so this was the press release from 2019, where the 11th revision of the International Classification of Diseases defined um, for the first time, they updated their definition of burnout and, and for the first time, uh, uh, clearly connected it to being a workplace phenomenon. Um, and they made it clear that you should not apply the term burnout to any other um, situations in your life. This is really a workplace phenomenon. And it's characterized by three dimensions, um, feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion, increased mental distance from one's job or feelings of, of cynicism about your job and reduced professional efficacy. And it's important to, to know that burnout is not just this sort of you are or are not burnt out sort of binary um, state. There are stages of burnout and, um, and we're sort of moving back and forth on this continuum um, uh, quite often. I mean, if you, how, if you look at stages one, two, and three, the joke in healthcare is that um, people in stages one, two, and three are exactly who healthcare attracts. Um, so we all kind of laugh that we're all living somewhere between stages one and three most of the time. Um, and my guess is that that may be true for many of you as well, um, given the sort of more driven, high achieving uh, sorts who are attracted to this kind of work. Um, but again, it's, it's helpful to think of burnout on this continuum um, and, um, and recognize that, that you may be in very different places depending on what's going on for you. So compassion fatigue. So this is typically defined as stress resulting from helping or wanting to help people who are experiencing trauma or suffering. And it's uh, also um, thought to be defined by this draining of emotional energy for those um, who are dealing with the pain of others. Um, and most people interpret this term to mean that, that having too much compassion is depleting that when we have um, uh, extended compassion to a point that our tank is empty, then we are in this state of compassion fatigue. But describing compassion as fatiguing is actually not an accurate understanding of compassion. It's not an accurate understanding of what's happening when we have this, these kinds of feelings. So what is really going on here? So taking a step back, and if we're going to um, sort of define some of these terms, we have to start with, with what is empathy? So this is um, various definitions here, but the awareness of other people's emotions and the ability to understand their feelings uh, and emotions. And there's a cost that goes along with empathy. Uh, we feel it in our bodies. Um, we mirror each other's physiology along with 
uh, mirroring emotion. And negative states in others, pain, anxiety, um, anger, create high activation and arousal in us. Um, sometimes it's referred to as emotional contagion. And this can lead to burnout in healthcare workers and, and other um, uh, human service uh, professions. Um, there are different definitions of compassion, but all of them have sort of at their core uh, that it's a relational process that involves noticing another person's pain. So that, um, that's that's the the empathy piece of things. Um, and there's this added uh, piece that turns empathy into compassion, which is acting in some way to help ease or alleviate that pain. So um, what ends up happening here is that when we start with empathy, we can take two different paths. We, um, the first path is the path of, of compassion. And when we are in a space or a, a place of compassion, it is nourishing for us. It is uplifting. It's associated with, um, with positive feelings. Um, it's, it's connected to that intention of, of help. We remain other focused, um, which is an essential element of, of compassion. But the other path that's very easy to take um, in the face of somebody's um, distress or suffering is that of empathic distress. In the face of another's pain, we can become dysregulated ourselves and we start to shift our focus to our own distress. So the state of emotional dysregulation is where we can get stuck. And that's the thing that leads to what we've uh, incorrectly labeled as, as compassion fatigue. It's really empathic distress. And the key here between these two is the ability to emotionally regulate when we are um, in the presence of somebody who is struggling. I'm gonna give you a very brief example. I'm gonna try not to take too much time um, on this, but um, just to sort of um, show you how this, this kind of works. Um, I was sitting with a mom of a 12 year old girl who had been in the hospital for, for months with an autoimmune neuropsych neuropsychiatric condition that is associated with um, sudden onset of really severe OCD and extreme behavior changes. And various treatments had not been uh, very effective. And this mom was really pushing for an experimental treatment that the medical team was not comfortable giving. The case had come to the ethics committee um, and I was co-chair at the time. And as the co-chair of the ethics committee, I was meeting with the mom after our meeting to share with her the outcome of the um, committee and uh, or a committee meeting and and share with her that the ethics committee was um, supporting the medical team's decision to not offer the experimental treatment that she was pushing for. During this conversation, she became really upset and she began yelling, and I would say actually screaming. Um, I immediately felt my heart rate shoot up. Um, and this was the fork in the road for me. What I did was immediately notice that change in my physiology. And I used some grounding and breathing techniques to calm my nervous system. This allowed me to stay focused on her distress, not my distress. I was able to see her reaction, her extreme reaction as having nothing at all to do with me and everything to do with the situation. I didn't personalize what was happening and saw it um, not really as anger, but a manifestation of intense fear and grief that she was not going to leave the hospital with the same child she had before this all started. When I calmly and gently acknowledged her fear, she stopped yelling and she began to cry. But if I had not had the skills to emotionally regulate in that moment, I would have become more and more dysregulated myself. Um, I would have, it would have become harder for me to stay focused on her and her experience because I would have started to become more focused on my own anxiety um, and my own discomfort. Um, during this interaction, a security guard popped his head actually into the room and asked if everything was okay. And I said, we were fine and had him leave. 
But had I gotten stuck in my own dysregulation, I probably would have asked him to stay, um, which might have made me feel safer, but it would have likely triggered embarrassment and shame in this mom. So that's an example of how um, the ability to stay emotionally regulated in these situations can help you stay on that path of compassion and not get flipped into um, empathic distress. And this is another, um, you know, if you think back to that window of tolerance that I showed you before, this is sort of another depiction of that, you know, in these situations, if we can stay regulated, we stay in this, what some call the resilience zone, some call the relational zone, um, but we can get um, kicked out of that zone and get stuck in the high zone, or we can get stuck in the low zone. And our goal is, is to really stay um, regulated and in the middle. Um, so th there's actually a neuroscience of compassion. Um, and you don't have to get bogged down in the details of this slide. It's just a way of, um, of sort of showing you that um, uh, there, there have been functional magnetic resonance imaging studies that, that show how when you're in a state of compassion versus a state of empathic distress, um, different areas of our brain are actually activated. And empathic care on this slide is, is how they referred to, um, uh, how they uh, uh, labeled compassion. So these studies show that the neurologic areas um, that are activated with compassion are different than the areas activated when we're in an empathic distress. And the areas associated with compassion are linked to the reward and affiliation uh, processing areas of our brain and are associated with oxytocin and vasopressin receptors that are thought to stimulate um, positive affect towards those who are suffering. The neural networks that are activated uh, by empathic distress um, actually are more associated with the areas of the brain uh, where we experience pain. So it's incredibly interesting that there's actually science behind there being a, a, a difference between um, the experience of compassion or being in a state of compassion uh, versus being stuck in empathic distress. So kind of coming back to this notion of, of compassion fatigue not being quite the right way to think about it, um, I, I think that it's it's more helpful to think in terms of there are things that contribute to a breakdown in, in compassion for us or a reduced capacity for compassion. Empathic distress is one of those things, but also um, a lot of other interpersonal stress um, or burnout are also things that can contribute to a breakdown in compassion and, and reduce our, our capacity um, to stay in that sort of regulated, compassionate state. So, yeah, um, our challenge always is, is figuring out how to sustain our compassion and well-being uh, through um, what I'll offer here is this idea of co-creating healing environments. Um, all of us uh, have some uh, have a great deal of personal responsibility for taking care of ourselves, for um, managing our work-life balance or um, work-life integration in, in a healthy way. But the organizations we work for also have a responsibility to help create environments that foster um, healing and well-being. And um, at the Short Center, we uh, focus a lot on this idea of um, of creating healing organizations, that that should be the aspirational goal, certainly of healthcare organizations, but I would say of any um, human service or um, organization. And we know that organizations are impacted by trauma just like individuals are, and they can become what we refer to as trauma-organized reactive systems. Um, and you may recognize some things in the trauma-organized category. Um, but organizations that are intentional about creating space for reflection in order to be able to process the work and, um, and allow us to process in a way that, that helps us make meaning out of our experiences, um, organizations that have a growth mindset um, and a commitment to relational leadership, these are the organizations where staff can, can thrive despite the inherent um, stress and trauma that, that is kind of a natural part of the work. And so the work of the Short Center is really focused on um, helping organizations embed these practices within um, their organizations. 
Um, I'm gonna share with you a little bit about um, our two main programs. Um, so uh, Stress First Aid, uh, which is a self-care and peer support program and, um, and Schwartz Rounds. Uh, which is a space for um, coming together for connection, reflection, and meaning making about some of the most challenging aspects of the work. Um, and these programs, um, you know, uh, by incorporating the, the key elements that are listed here, um, are essential in helping recovery from, uh, or, or put people on a path to recovery from stress injury and trauma. So um, I'm going to start first with a little bit about stress first aid. Um, so it is a framework for psychological self-care and peer support. It was created um, initially by the National Center for PTSD for the military and, and then um, for first responders. And, and uh, we've, we've adapted um, this framework um, uh, for uh, the organizations that we work for. And, and really the stress first aid framework is parallel to how a first responder approaches physical first aid. So you intervene um, when needed to remove a stressor, you're trying to prevent further harm, and you're trying to promote recovery. And peer support is a really central piece of this. Um, and why? Uh, because we know um, that there are an awful lot of people in healthcare, um, human service work in general, um, who are, are unlikely to actually seek help. Um, that's that stoicism, that sort of, you know, that kind of work ethic, that, um, that commitment to the work, uh, that sense that, you know, I'm kind of bulletproof and I can um, do this without any help. Um, and because there's a tendency for those types of folks to end up in these professions, we know that we are more likely to listen to our peers um, than anyone else. So it's really about embedding um, some of these uh, skills and kind of creating a, a peer support network. One of the main tools in uh, Stress First Aid is uh, the stress continuum. Um, and this can be really useful as um, a self-assessment tool to detect um, your own early reactions um, that you're having in the face of stress. And it can serve as a communication tool in an organization, helping people move past the, um, the sort of usual I'm fine response to, um, to that question of how are you. And when I was at Stanford, um, my team uh, began every day with a check-in on the stress continuum. And we all tended to get really creative about um, our colors. So, uh, you know, we were sort of greenish yellow or um, one person on my team um, found all of these cool uh, names at a paint store for different shades of yellow, different shades of orange, different shades of green, and would, would uh, use those, um, those fun names um, to highlight that, that even within um, a particular category like yellow, um, there, there's uh, a lot of uh, variation and gradation in where you are, um, even within that particular zone. And the stress continuum really normalizes this idea that we're always moving back and forth um, on this continuum. And that the goal is to recognize where you are so that you can take appropriate action to get yourself back towards the green. And between yellow and the yellow and orange zones, um, that's where um, stress injuries uh, can occur. And what's a stress injury? It's, it's referred to as significant distress or functional impairment arising from intense and persistent stress. So, you know, you can be sort of, you know, move from green into yellow. That can be kind of the sort of day-to-day, -day, um, you know, hassles that we all encounter. But when you start to move from that yellow zone to orange, and then certainly on your way to red, um, it's between yellow and orange where, um, where we can uh, experience stress injury. And we typically think of four um, uh, buckets or four causes of, of stress injury. You can have a traumatic injury, exposure to trauma or um, someone else's trauma, your own trauma, um, a grief injury um, in healthcare, uh, you know, that occurs um, in the setting of losing um, a patient. 
um, but it's also about sort of personal grief injury. Uh, we bring our whole selves to our work. And if we have these things going on in our personal lives, um, that is uh, part of what, uh, how we end up in different places on that stress continuum. There could be inner conflict or moral injury, uh, moral distress and moral injury, which um, my guess is you have your fair share of. And then uh, what we call uh, a fatigue injury that comes from the accumulation of stress, the wear and tear of stress over time, uh, which is the most common um, cause of stress injury and, and also one that I'm guessing you uh, can easily relate to. Um, and part of the stress first aid model is, is um, anchoring uh, our first aid actions, stress first aid actions in uh, five evidence informed factors that we know help people recover from adversity and stress. Um, so the first key factor is to restore a sense of physical and psychological safety. This might look like helping someone get out of an intense situation to get to a more quiet place where they're gonna be able to, uh, to, to calm um, down a little bit. Calm is about helping someone who's overwhelmed to emotionally regulate. This might look like encouraging them to do some, some slow breathing or to take a break. Um, connect is just that, um, incorporating connection and social support, which we know is really essential. Self-efficacy is based on the recognition that sometimes when we've been severely impacted by an event, we can lose our sense of feeling confident and capable. Um, and peer support may be focused on helping that person regain their sense of confidence or belief in their capabilities. And then hope um, is about helping someone restore their sense of optimism or the belief that things will work out um, and, and, and that sometimes significant growth follows um, significant adversity. And in the, the stress first aid uh, framework, um, when we're talking about embedding um, this in an organization or within a team, um, that there are really three elements to, um, to the peer support. And if, if you um, embed these three things, um, you can kind of imagine how um, it elevates um, how that team works together. So, you know, if, if, if everybody becomes more intentional about recognizing when a coworker is showing signs of a stress injury and that not just recognizing it, but you, if you see it, you say something, um, either to that person or you you reach out to um, to someone else who you feel may be in a better position to um, check check in with them or provide that support. And then if everybody knows a couple of resources um, that you can offer a coworker in distress, um, whether they're resources that are um, offered by the organization, like um, employee assistance program, that kind of thing, um, or any other resources that you have found helpful for yourself. It's offering those um, uh, in, in an effort to um, um, help them find a bridge to uh, recovering from what they've been through. Um, and, you know, really, I like to think about stress first aid um, as playing a role in creating some shared language for how we talk about stress and stress injury. It normalizes those conversations. It embeds relational practices in an organization. It becomes part of just how we do things around here, that we check in with each other, we pay attention to our coworkers who seem to, um, to be a little different today, a little quieter. Um, uh, we sort of notice those signs of change and we have a shared sense of responsibility for one another. Um, and, and that really fosters this idea of team resilience. And, Team resilience is different from individual resilience. Sometimes people think team resilience is the aggregate of individual resilience. Um, so if you have a team of people who are all individually very resilient, therefore you have a resilient team. And that's actually not what this um, is tapping into. Um, healthcare is notorious for having a lot of really gritty, individually resilient people but when you come together as a team, you don't work well together as a team. Um, there may not be a lot of support across that team. Um, you may not uh, share the pressures that, um, that impact your team sort of evenly across the team. You may not sort of look to help each other with, um, you know, with balancing the, the load. So, um, so stress first aid and sort of embedding those practices can really augment this idea of team resilience and how that team comes together and works together to face the uh, common challenges. 
So now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Schwartz rounds. Um, this is kind of uh, this was our, um, our our really first program and the one that has gotten the most traction. Um, we are in about 600 hospitals now, over 600 hospitals, including hospitals in the UK and Australia and Canada. Um, and and. Schwartz Rounds is a forum for um, sharing uh, stories with one another about the impact, the emotional impact of our work. I don't need to get into um, all of the details, but essentially the essence of the Schwartz Rounds experience is storytelling and story listening. And I love these um, two quotes, um, one being that storytelling is the currency of human contact, uh, which I really, really believe. Um, uh, but but this other one, when we when we tell and listen to stories, we can almost feel our souls breathing fully and deeply, our capacity to see options, to visualize possibilities, to imagine expands, and we are somehow more alive. Um, this is just an example of some of the topics. There's a topic for each Schwartz rounds, and people are sharing stories and reflections related to that topic. These are some actual topics from the, the last year uh, from some of our member organizations, um, and it just gives you a flavor um, for uh, what these storytelling and story listening spaces um, are tapping into. And um, you know, if we connect back to um, the key factors that promote recovery from adversity and stress, Schwartz rounds in the experience of coming together to reflect on the impact of the work um, helps people um, with the important process of meaning making, which is healing in that it connects us back to hope. Um, this is uh, an example of, of kintsugi, which is the Japanese art of repairing ceramic pottery using gold or silver lacquer, uh, which creates something that is stronger than it was before and arguably more beautiful and interesting than it was before. And for me, this so beautifully captures the idea of positive change after adversity. I came across a quote about kintsugi that says, it is a way of embracing every flaw and imperfection. Every crack is a part of the history of that object and it becomes more beautiful precisely because it has been broken. People are the same. So when we share our stories with each other in a way, it, it is a way of reminding us um, of what we've been through. It's a way of mending the cracks and honoring the ways in which we are changed because of what we've experienced. Which um, connects with this idea of post-traumatic growth. Um, so uh, post-traumatic growth refers to the psychological change that comes as a result of the struggle with adversity or challenging life circumstances. There are multiple areas of potential growth, greater appreciation of life, greater appreciation and strengthening of relationships, um, increased compassion and altruism, um, enhanced spiritual development. But the key to turning adversity into this kind of advantage is the extent to which we are willing to explore our thoughts and feelings surrounding um, that event. And the ability to cognitively explore that event and to be really curious about the complexity and the confusion is what helps us to um, arrive at um, a new sense of, of meaning and do that meaning making um, that is so important in recovery. Now, I don't know if any of you are Peloton fans. I really am. Um, and uh, during a Peloton class, um, one of the instructors um, uh, said this quote, which I immediately started uh, putting into my phone so I wouldn't uh, forget it. But she said, if we don't allow ourselves to feel what we are going through, then we miss the change that's waiting for us. And that is, um, is ultimately what, um, what Schwartz rounds and, and sharing our stories with each other is about. It's about allowing ourselves to feel what we've been through um, and um, keeping us open and curious about the change um, that, that will happen as a result. And that is uh, the end um, of my slides.
I have managed to give us a few a uh, bit of time uh, to, um, to to talk and see um, what uh, reflections you all have. Wonderful. Julie, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, I learned so much. Uh, I really appreciate you, you taking the time to share that with us. And definitely so much that I think certainly resonates from my experience and I hope for uh, for all the other caseworkers out there too. Um, folks, please feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A. Um, I have a couple from um, from your presentation to kick us off, but we'll, we'll do our best to um, to get to everybody. But Maybe could we could we dig in on something that I really really want to make sure that we we hit on, which is you mentioned um, uh, we mentioned in your bio that you worked on the support team for caregivers who had uh, been on the receiving end of threats of violence, and you mentioned some of the interaction with the mother and the security guard. Um, something caseworkers have unfortunately had to deal with recently has been an uptick in threats of violence against members, and that comes down to staff. We saw the attack on uh, Rep Connolly's office, and there have been others recently. So I know that's kind of top of mind. Um, from your experience working with caregivers, how do you how do you recommend balancing that that instinct for the kind of the empathetic response against keeping an eye on on the security and on the safety of of their team and, and everyone else in the office? Yeah, and I, and I'm going to say that this is where I think there's um, probably something really different about your setting versus um, healthcare, even though there have been um, a number of news stories lately um, about um, uh, healthcare workers um, being shot. Um, those, uh, those events are actually still pretty rare given the number of um, healthcare contacts there are every day in this country. And the vast majority of situations um, that tend to happen in healthcare where um, are, are and, and what my team uh, was um, uh, creating sort of a response to is extreme dysregulation of traumatized people um, who are triggered by um, whatever is happening in that healthcare environment. And, you know, in pediatrics, it's parents who um, you know, are, are dealing with the threat of the loss of their child or some, you know, permanent impairment for their child. And um, they often have trauma histories and um, the whole situation is so activating. And, and most of those individuals are not actually dangerous. They are extremely dysregulated. And the challenge is that, you know, we can't expect um, all of our healthcare staff to have the kind of skills that I have as a mental health professional to be able to discern, is this somebody who's really unsafe um, and, and really uh, may um, um, do something dangerous versus this is somebody who is um, in a great deal of distress and is struggling and they're yelling and they're swearing, um, but they're not dangerous. And, and I will say that I, part of, Part of the benefit of, of learning how to stay in that regulated state of compassion is that I'm also able to tap into my other threat detection system, which I will say I have, which is the minute I start to feel this prickly sensation of the hair standing up on the back of my neck, I know we are in a different zone and I will respond differently. You are all, unfortunately, I think, um, given the heightened political climate that we are in, I think you're in a very different um, place when it comes to talking about uh, violence and, and workplace safety. And I am not sure that I feel like I can say a lot about how to deal with that because I think there are very real threats that you absolutely need to be um, uh, creating, um, you know, sort of safety mechanisms for. The one thing I can say is that anytime anybody has experienced anything that feels threatening, it is it is a trauma somewhere on that spectrum between small T and big T. And what I can say about that is that um, that needs a response. Whatever the safety response is from security, from whatever, the police, um, that's one set of, of maneuvers. But then the other is being sure that each person who experiences that um, has some some care afterwards. There needs to be some caretaking of anybody who's been in that situation afterwards and caretaking of each other and a recognition that it is not possible if you have felt really threatened 
um, or really in danger for you to just get up the next morning and go about your day like it didn't happen. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's embedding um, that awareness, that understanding, and that permission to feel for as long as you need to feel it, um, you know, the aftermath of that experience. Yeah, that's that's really important. And I really appreciate that. Uh, and let me just also flag for folks again, we can send this out uh, in the wrap up email, but we do have some resources for district offices on considering safety and making safety plans that we developed uh, in partnership with the Nas National Association of Social Workers. So happy to re-up those, or I can drop them in the chat if folks, uh, if that's helpful for anyone. Um, and we have some questions coming in. So, and I think there are some themes coming out here. So maybe let me try to organize a little bit here, but um, both Catherine and Carolyn are kind of talking about um, getting to a place for maybe your caseworkers or casework managers feel like they have to, um, they have to make the case for within their office for why this kind of uh, this kind of support and these kind of resources are so important. So I guess there's kind of a two part question. If you're a casework manager, or you're a caseworker. Do you have advice for managing up to kind of create those spaces and build those resources for creating a healing organization? And if there isn't support coming from from higher up, kind of what can casework caseworkers casework managers do immediately to to make things better for their their peers? Yeah, so um, so managing up is always a challenge, um, and I've had, had to do that a lot over the years, um, and, and there was a lot of managing up in this space of well-being, um, you know, 15, 20 years ago in healthcare when there really was no um, sort of um, true understanding about um, the impact of the work and how um, that sets people up for, for burnout. It means that people leave their jobs. I mean, and all of that is true for congressional caseworkers as well, right? And I think, um, uh, you know, to look at things like um, retention, do we have a problem with retention? Um, you know, do people come and stay for a year or two and then we don't have people staying longer than that because they're like, I'm out, I, I can't do this anymore. So those are some of the, the metrics that can sometimes be helpful in terms of thinking about, um, you know, these are, you um, initiatives, interventions that can address um, retention and performance. We all perform better if we are uh, feeling supported and, and well. Um, and, um, and I think, I would guess that most um, of those in positions of um, authority and, and decision making would understand that congressional caseworkers are um, our first responders. I, it, I mean, that seems to, to be an easy case to make. And um, if you go to the National Center for PTSD's website, where they have all of these lovely stress first aid uh, materials, um, tapping into the materials that are specifically for, they have a website for healthcare, but, but tapping into the ones for first responders and maybe taking that and using that as a, um, a platform for saying, you know, we are first responders like like all of these other types of first responders and the National Center for PTSD developed this framework to recognize that first responders um, are significantly impacted by the role of being a first responder. And um, we will be better at our jobs um, as first responders if we um, take care of our people. Um, and, and even if the sort of higher ups are, um, are slow uh, on the uptake with all of this, um, it, there are obviously many aspects of the stress first aid framework that um, a manager can um, incorporate into their team. Um, these again are not um, super sophisticated concepts, right? I mean, the stress continuum, even if, if everybody embedded that into, you know, a daily check-in or it becomes that, that shared language that we have, if you come into a meeting and somebody says, Ugh, I'm really orange today, that cues everybody to know, all right, we, you know, we need to take a little time and, and, you know, what do you need? How can we help? You know, so I think there are lots of ways that you can, you can embed that. Um, I love that. I love the idea of that color coded check in. I had scribbled that everywhere on here. Um, I think for folks looking for immediate actionable, that is so smart and so so thoughtful. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, let me pull out also, uh, Carol. I know we kind of covered a bit of Carolyn's question, Carolyn, uh, with Rep. Uh, Rep. Ballant. 
And we also say, Carolyn uh, and Vermont team, we're thinking of y'all as you're recovering from the floods. Um, but Carolyn mentioned specifically being a, a team that's been responding to a natural disaster, which can be such an incredible moment of stress for, for a casework team. Um, any specific, I know the, sh the Schwartz Center has worked with caregivers in the af aftermath of the Boston Marathon bombing and some others. Um, do you have specific tips for, for organizations on dealing with response to kind of a big traumatic event as a team? Yeah, um, uh, I actually, I should have included a slide. Um, I don't know if I can easily find it, but um, I, I can actually share it with you um, afterwards and you can share it with the group. Um, there is a trajectory of recovery after a traumatic event. And, um, you know, um, often there, there's this sort of um, early kind of esprit de corps, something happens, you know, a flood, fire, whatever it is. And there's this initial esprit de corps as everybody sort of rallies to respond. And there's this sort of honeymoon period where we're all in there, we're feeling good because we're helping. And, um, and, then, and then it starts to, to drop off. And um, after the um, initial, um, you know, part of the, the traumatic event is sort of receding. Um, there's that sort of emotional aftermath. And, um, and, if, and if it's been particularly traumatic for those who, have, who are responding or you saw some really difficult things, um, there's a period of time where um, you can feel like you're easily triggered by, by things, by reminders, um, not sleeping, um, having dreams or nightmares. I mean, there's this whole sort of um, aftermath after that initial, um, you know, rally and we're all in this together. Um, and um, that sort of ebbs and flows and you come up to the first anniversary um, and, and or anniversary reactions are a thing. Um, they are a very real thing. So you may, you know, six, seven months in be feeling like, okay, you know, we're I'm doing okay. I've sort of gotten past this. And then as the anniversary approaches, um, there's often an uptick in, um, in symptoms, in, in dreams, in thoughts about it, in, you know, kind of memories kind of coming back or, or feeling triggered by things. Um, and What's important about that is is making space for that and recognizing that that's actually normal. That is part of how we process uh, trauma. I think what we can do is we can, you know, start to feel like, oh, there's something wrong with me that I'm um, I'm having these reactions. It's it's been a it's been a year. I should be over it, you know. Um, uh, and in fact. Um, what's normal is having those experiences, um, you know, to greater or lesser degrees, the more disorienting they are, the more that person may need to actually get some outside help. But for most people, we don't develop PTSD, but that doesn't mean we don't still have a trauma reaction um, and need to make space for that. Um, and then once you get past that first anniversary, um, then, then there's sort of what we consider sort of the, the sort of actual um, kind of recovery, um, but it's never linear. And um, it's going to have its own peaks and valleys and in, in terms of um, how smooth that recovery process is. Some of that's related to, you know, the sort of degree of exposure to trauma or how much um, of, of actual trauma you yourself had. It's very much also dependent on our own histories. We all have some kind of trauma histories. And um, for those who have more significant trauma histories, um, this kind of exposure to trauma in the work um, is, is going to be more challenging to process. Um, so I'm not sure how helpful that was, but um, uh, that's where all the stress first aid stuff actually really is very helpful in terms of embedding that in, in as part of how we care for each other and ourselves as we are caring for others who are experiencing um, some kind of, of um, traumatic event or disaster. That's awesome. And yeah, let me echo, echo Carolyn's second point. Of, it would be wonderful to see that slide. And I think so helpful for mm -hmm. casework managers to think about kind of that cyclical nature. Um, it can be so easy to just get buried in the day-to-day -day casework by kind of thinking, all right, how do we plan for making sure my team has the space that they might need around an anniversary. I think it's such, such useful advice. That's wonderful. Right. That's actually, anniversaries are actually a great time for something like Schwartz Rounds, because that's, that's when sharing our stories and the meaning we have made 
of that experience and um, sharing that with each other uh, can be really, really helpful. That's wonderful. Yeah, I, I absolutely appreciate that. Um, and we have a, a question about um, about VA medical centers and where where does the Schwartz Center work? Uh, uh, ask, uh, I hear a lot of complaints from vets about VAMC staff not providing trauma informed care. So it sounds like we might have a a referral for the Schwartz team. I know, and, and I'll, I'll be honest with you that um, you know uh, every organization is a work in progress, and just because they may have Schwartz rounds uh, doesn't mean that um, they've been able to. Um, deeply incorporate all of the trauma-informed principles that we would like um, into the work. And some of it is, you know, it's an enormous bureaucracy and bureaucracies um, always have a way of squeezing uh, the, the kindness and compassion out of systems. So, um, you know, um, that unfortunately is a thing. I did find my slide. Um, oh, it's wonderful. from another presentation. Um, so some of what's on the slide won't be as um, as helpful, but um, let me put this in presenter mode here. There we go. Um, this was from a something we did about the pandemic and um, in my other organization and, and how the trajectory of trauma was so different with the pandemic because it was a disaster that just wouldn't end. <laughs> um, and so, you know, following the typical trajectory of trauma with the pandemic was hard because every time we were coming up again, uh, up towards an anniversary reaction, we had another surge and we got pulled back. Um, so it was a different kind of, um, of sort of disaster or trauma, but this is the trajectory um, of trauma. That is so helpful. Um, and Julia, if, you, if you're able to send that to me, I can send yeah. it out uh, in the, our wrap up after this event too, if that's helpful for- Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, and then we have such a good question and oh my gosh, I relate to this one so hard. Um, Kelly asks, one of my biggest struggles is work-life balance. Workload volume is always a challenge. It's hard to walk away from work at 5 p.m. because there is a real person in need waiting to hear back um, in part because the stress that's felt when this work piles up. What advice do you have? about handling that very, very real condition of doing casework. And it's the very, it's it's the essence of the human condition as a healthcare provider as well, right? I mean, this is this is one of those things that healthcare and casework, I think, um, you know, just sort of share this universal struggle. Um, you know, I will say, um, for me, it certainly has been um, a work in progress um, that, you know, work-life balance and work-life integration, in some ways, work-life integration is a, I've always thought is sort of a better way to think about it because in this kind of work, it isn't like you leave work and you're done. You're never done. I mean, the work is never finished and that's the hard thing. And so, you know, it's really just this journey of figuring out how to create, um, healthy boundaries, sort of a boundary approach to this work. And that doesn't mean that you shut off. It may mean like I finally quit looking at my phone immediately before I went to bed, right? I mean, it's it's sort of basic things like that. It's recognizing that on my way home, um, I would ask myself that question, what do I need tonight when I get home? What was my day like and what do I need? That's the essence of what is referred to as um, essential self-compassion, asking yourself throughout the day, what do I need? Uh, um, and if when I get home, what I need is to, um, you know, back in the days when I had, you know, three young kids, what I need is to just pick up dinner tonight and, um, and not um, make dinner when I get home because the day was really shitty. That's, you know, that's an example of sort of how you start to ask yourself that question and, and respond in healthy ways to, you know, what do I need based on what I've been going through? And, and where do I have to, you know, the, the self-sacrifice is only so helpful to those you're trying to help because if you're burning out in the process and you are dysregulated because you are burning out in the process, you actually are not showing up in the way that you wanna show up at work. Um, so things like not checking my phone at night and, um, uh, being really intentional on the weekends um, around how much I was really going to look at my email. Um, those kinds of things are important and can be balanced with, I am better in my job if I set those boundaries and um, continuing to sacrifice myself 
in the long run actually doesn't serve the people that I'm trying to help. But it's a journey and um, it doesn't mean that I actually, after all these years, still have it worked out because occasionally I will still fall into some of the little traps. <laughs> It happens. And I think that's important too, that if you're struggling with the work-life life balance, know that you're not alone. You don't need to beat yourself up for not also mastering work-life balance when you've devoted so much time and energy to casework mastery. Um, Julie, I know we're at time. So I just want to say again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you again so much for all of your work and for your willingness to share uh, share with this group and chat with us about um, how much of this is is so applicable and there's so much for caseworkers to learn from and adapt from, from your work, from the Schwartz Center's work. So thank you. Thank you again. Um, I will follow up with a video from this talk uh, and a couple of other resources that we mentioned today. Um, folks, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to reach out. We are at casework at popfox.org. I am at Anne at popfox.org. And all of our materials for caseworkers are, um, are at popfox.org slash casework. Um, um, I, I will send this. I'll send a PDF of the slides, and I will. I will just take that other trajectory of trauma slide and throw it in the deck and create a PDF. So I'll, I'll send it to you. Thank you shortly. So awesome, Great. everyone. Hang in there. Happy Friday. Take care of yourselves, and thank you so again so much for joining us today. Thank Bye, you, everyone. everyone.